Grace and peace be unto you from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text today is from the Old Testament prophet Micah. And Micah has these words from Micah chapter 6. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams and with ten thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? God has told you, O oh man, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. This is our text. Please be seated. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, dear friends in Christ. This is a lovely sanctuary. You are blessed here at St. Luke Lutheran Church in Ottawa to have this beautiful house of God to worship in. It's a place of peace and quiet. It's a place of security and safety. It's the house of God. It's a place that just even smells familiar when you walk in, doesn't it? Not so the temple of God in Jerusalem. You know, we often think of the temple of God in Jerusalem as a nice, quiet place where people would meditate and pray and, and hear God's word in an orderly fashion. But that's not the case of the temple in Jerusalem. It was not a peaceful place. There was a lot of animal sounds because there were doves, turtle doves and pigeons held in the outer courtyard of the temple for people to buy for their sacrifices like we heard in today's gospel reading where Mary and Joseph brought Jesus and gave the sacrifice for purification. One turtle dove or two young pigeons for a poor family like Joseph and Mary were. It was a place that was filled with the cacophony of the animal sounds, the bleating of sheep and the uh, mooing of cattle. It was filled with the sounds of animals being killed and all of the sights and imaginable along with the killing and the sacrificing of those animals. The temple was not a place of quiet and peace. But that's what God told the people to have at their temple to be. And he ordained those sacrifices that was part of God's command. But the prophet Micah goes a little beyond all of that. He asks, with what shall I come before the Lord today? Shall I come with burnt offerings? That's starting out kind of small. Shall I come with calves a year old? Well, that's getting a little larger. Can you imagine bringing your year-old calves into the church today? Ah, uh, I think that would kind of cause a little bit of turmoil and, and uh, some interesting glances from your fellow worshipers. But then Micah goes even larger. He says, would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams? Can you imagine bringing a thousand or a, 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 even, even a thousand, let alone thousands of sheep into the Lord's house today? Or he gets even larger, ten thousands of rivers of oil pouring out upon the chancel, upon the altar. Can you imagine the sight of that? Altar guild ladies, can you imagine the cleanup that would happen after that? 
I think there may be some things to say about all of that. We struggle to think about coming before the Lord with things. But I ask you today, what did you bring to church with you? With what are you coming before the Lord today? That may sound like a strange question. We don't often think in those terms as we head for church on a Sunday morning, do we? We struggle to get out of the house in good time so that we're not late for church. We think about what's happening in church and what our responsibilities are for the morning. Is there something happening that I need to bring food for? Or do I need to make an announcement? Or ask pastor about something Ask him to make an announcement about something happening. Uh, We've got all kinds of things on our minds. Do I need to make sure I discuss this or that with somebody this morning? Or do I need to think about something that I have to do maybe before or after church? But it isn't very common for us to think in terms of coming before the Lord. But that's what we're doing this morning. That's what we do every time we enter this sanctuary. We're coming into God's presence. And what an awesome privilege that is. And in some ways, it's kind of a daunting prospect because it brings to mind the question that is the subject heading over this section of Scripture in the Bible today. What does the Lord require that I come before him with today. What does he expect of us as we come into his presence and as we bow down before him? Perhaps one thought was what we might have had this morning. Ah, do I have my offering with me? And that seems to be what's on the prophet Michael's mind as he brings these a uh, series of ever-expanding gifts that he bring, talks about bringing into the house of the Lord. And these, off, these gifts that God, that Micah talks about, make our offerings pale in comparison, don't they? But it ends with the biggest one. He's talking about coming into God's presence. And our natural reaction is that we recognize that when we come into the presence of our holy God, we're hopelessly sinful. We're hopelessly broken. And there is no way we can stand before our holy and triune God. And at the beginning of Micah's talk in chapter 6, he talks about the indictment that the Lord has about his people. He calls all of creation to fill the courtroom and to serve as the jury as he brings forward his indictment against us. He says, he will contend with this people and battle this case out in court. It's obviously a big deal to God, this indictment he has against us. So what is this indictment? Micah talks about it and he says, the indictment is that my people have forgotten me. My people have forgotten what I am all about in relationship with them. They've forgotten that I brought them out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. They've forgotten that I opened the doors of the promised land for them and defeated all of their enemies for them so that they can live in my promised land. That land flowing with milk and honey. That land full of the riches of God's blessings. They've forgotten that I am the Lord, their God, and that They should serve me only. Doesn't that happen all the time? Some global catastrophe happens and it's an act of God. 
and sometimes bad things happen in our lives and we get all up in arms and blame God for them. And that's what the people of Israel were doing. They were going through tough times and they were saying, God's forgotten us. It's all God's fault. He hates us. He has abandoned us. Where is God? And we do the same kind of thing. But what a misguided view of everything we have when we treat God that way. In our text, God lays out the truth about his relationship with his people. He reminds them that what he did for them was to save them. And what he promises to do is to never leave them or forsake them. He mentions that the mind of every Israelite would fill in the blanks as they talk about their exodus out of Egypt, their time in the wilderness, their entry into the promised land, the building of the temple, and the filling of the temple with the glory of God. God then reminds them how he put Moses and Aaron and Miriam in place as their leaders. But they misused the Ten Commandments that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. They put the wrong understanding on the sacrificial acts that they were called to do in the temple. And instead of it being a joyful thanksgiving offering to God in celebration of the relationship that he had established with them, these sacrifices became their duty. These sacrifices became a way to earn God's favor. And so they were going to bring ten thousands of rivers of oil, thousands of rams, tens of thousands of cattle, all of us in order to earn God's favor. But all of these are just symptoms of the real indictment that God was leveling against his people. The bottom line accusation God has is that his people have not done what he requires of them. Have you done what the Lord requires of you? Does the indictment hold true for you and me as well? <clears throat> Micah makes, takes a final appalling step with these sacrifices. And he says, shall I give my firstborn for my transgression? The fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? Micah knows the truth that Paul would later express so clearly. The wages of sin is death. And death is the requirement that God has for our sin. And even the end of the reading gives us no hope. For which one of us has faithfully done what the Lord requires of us? Perfectly done justice in every circumstance. Acted with loving kindness toward our neighbors, family, and friends. And especially the last one. Have we lived in humility, in our relationship with our Lord. That's why we need what Paul says in his letter to the Corinthians. He says so clearly that there are two kinds of people. There are those who are perishing and those who are being saved. And what is the difference between the two? It isn't how many calves you bring for an offering. It isn't how many rivers of oil you pour on the altar. It isn't sacrificing your children either. Children, I'm glad, I bet you're glad to hear that. It isn't sacrificing yourself either. What matters is Jesus and his sacrifice for you. Sacrificing yourself or your children don't matter. But God sacrificed his first and only begotten son. The sacrifice of Jesus makes the difference. Jesus' death on the cross is the power of God unto salvation for all who believe. There at the cross, Jesus' blood is poured out in a cleansing flood to wash away all of our sins. There at the cross is Christ's all-atoning sacrifice, which pays the debt which you and I owe God, our Creator, eternal death. That's what Jesus suffered for you. That's what Jesus suffered for me. 
And there at the cross, as darkness covered the earth for a few hours, Jesus, the light of the world, crushed the power of darkness, the power of evil, crushed Satan's head completely, and brought life and immortality to light for you and for me and for all believers in Christ. So what did you bring before God today? Did you bring your offering? Praise be to God. Bring your gift to the Lord, whether large or small, and let it be a joyful response to Christ's death for you. It is the power of salvation for your salvation in Christ. That cross. And your gift is simply a gift in gratitude for that. Did you come with your family today? Praise the Lord! There will be no physical sacrifices here today. And no children will be harmed during the preaching of this sermon. But young and old alike are here hearing the powerful, life-giving word of the cross. That in Christ we can all boldly enter the presence of our holy God because He has claimed us as His holy people. With what have you come before the Lord today? Have you brought your troubles? Have you brought your burdens and your cares? Praise the Lord! For He calls you to bring them to Him and to lay them on His shoulders because He cares for you. And He has shown that to you in His Son, Jesus. What have you brought to church with you today? Have you brought your sin-laden souls? Praise the Lord. For as we lay our sins on Jesus, the spotless Lamb of God, He bears them all and frees us from that eternal load. What have you come before the Lord today? Whatever it is, Bring it to Him and lay it on Him. Celebrate His love for you and glory in the cross, the power of God for salvation for you, for me, and for all who believe. Amen. And the peace of God that passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life everlasting. Amen.